Hey everybody, Nick here. And uh, so in this video, I wanted to just talk about what I think is maybe one of the most interesting fantasy role-playing settings ever created, uh, which is the world of Glorantha, which was created um, by Greg Stafford. Uh, and its origins predate role-playing games. So it was created out of Greg Stafford's interest and love of mythology and his kind of wide reading in mythology and anthropology and all of this kind of thing. And I think that that that, that root of it is the thing that gives Glorantha um, its uniqueness and that makes it a setting that is maybe unlike other fantasy settings. Um, certainly unlike other fantasy settings in the RPG um, community, but also unlike, I think, fantasy settings in fantasy fiction as well. You don't see a lot of uh, other settings that are like Glorantha. It is singularly unique and a reflection of, in many ways, um, the author's sensibilities. Um, and uh, even though Glorantha has been worked on by many different people over the years, it um, still, I think, retains um, much of the character that it had um, when Stafford um, created it. And um, uh, it first manifested to the public, basically, I think, in the form of um, uh, two board games, which is uh, the board game White Bear and Red Moon, and then the its sequel, I guess, if, you, if game you know, the sequel game, I guess it, it's just another game set in Glorantha, which is called Nomad Gods. Um, and White Bear Red Moon was set in Dragon Pass and was later republished, actually, by I think Avalon Hill or maybe Cassium did an edition of it later, and they retitled it Dragon Pass. Um, and uh, Nomad Gods was set in Prax which is sort of adjacent to um, Dragon Pass. Um, and both of those um, uh, were the initial offerings in Glorantha. So the initial sort of gaming settings. And they were also amongst the first things that Chaosium published. White Bear Red Moon was um, the first thing that Chaosium published. It was, it was uh, Greg Stafford just decided he was going to publish his own board game. He tried to get other people to publish it. He took it to various publishers and uh, and they weren't interested. So he decided, all right, I'm going to do this myself. And uh, so that's what got him started uh, publishing games. And after a few years, uh, some people approached him and, and they he'd become aware of uh, fantasy role-playing games. And they, they pitched him a fantasy role-playing game, um, RuneQuest, and because uh, they wanted to do a role-playing game set in Glorantha. And so RuneQuest is the thing that evolved out of that. Um, and Glorantha is definitely um, like baked into the, the way the RuneQuest rules are written is a reflection in many ways of what's, what's going on with Glorantha. But um, the setting in that the initial rule book is... Um, uh, not massively developed. There's there's a, a history, and certainly you get the feel of the setting of Glorantha, and the um, the kinds of characters that are being created for the setting are reflective of Glorantha, and um, and then there, there's certainly the the magic system also was really reflective of I think um, how different the setting was because this magic system wasn't didn't really resemble anything like. The kind of things you see in Dungeons and Dragons. So this was doing its own thing, and it was trippy too. There was a lot of weird stuff in the game, and um, you know um, there were you know um, most famously like a lot of people when they think about Glorantha, you know they point to things like the ducks and things like that. You know even though I think other people are kind of embarrassed by the ducks, but I think at this point the ducks are so associated with the setting that there's really no way you can't not have the ducks. <laughs> um, and people are like, what do you mean the ducks? Well, um, a guy that I guess back in the day, Stafford was just 
having people contribute to building the setting. And a friend of his just wanted to put Duckburg in there. And he pointed at a site and said, oh, let's call, let's put Duckburg in there. And of course he was, because he was a fan of, I guess, the Carl Barks, like Scrooge McDuck comics or something. And he wanted to put Duckburg on the map of Glorantha. And Greg was like, okay, we can't actually have Duckburg, but we'll have Duck Point, right? And like, you know, Howard the Duck was like hugely popular at the time. So this is like the mid 1970s. And so we have ducks in the game. So if you want to play your Howard the Duck sword and sorcery character, you know, here you go. <laughs> you know, um, and, uh, you know, that that's what, um, you know, that, that's just one of the things that's part of the setting, you know. Um, and, uh, and then of course the thing where that gets fascinating is then that interacts with, you know, his friend coming up with that then interacts with all of this deep mythic history that, that sort of underlies Glorantha. And so that's, I just, just a, a really nice example of the, the, um, the charm, I think of the setting, you know, and the kind of imaginative kind of reckless boldness of the setting which i kind of love that it just kind of does what it wants and it's not really you know it doesn't make sense but it's it's not a rationalized world it is a world that has crept out of our unconscious <laughs> um and that that that's why i think lorantha speaks to people is because it it it's it's pulling on these more kind of strange threads, you know, um, and it, it, again that comes out of the myths, it comes out of you know comics, it comes out of um, uh, probably a million fantasy fiction and a million other sources, um, and it just and and also gaming too, like what do people want to play in games and things like that. And that's one of the things I note about the setting is that, that if you start looking around at the different cultures in Glorantha, um, it's cool to like be, you know, a Praxian nomad who rides on a bison and, you know, wears, you know, a crazy headdress and, you know, has like spirit magic, you know, like that's cool. But it's also cool to be, you know, a lunar priestess who, you know, uh, you know, lives in the city and, you know, can do all kinds of strange things with sorcery and, uh, you know, um, is, a, is a very sophisticated person. Like, everybody is cool in the setting. <laughs> you know, like, that's the thing about it is, is that it is, it is a setting built for gamers, right, in so many ways. Uh, because you just start looking around at, like, the possibilities. And once you become aware of them it's you're just you start to like you know can just start thinking of characters right you know um and it's it's really easy to do that um and uh and and they're they're really cool you know and i, I think that that aspect of glartha shouldn't be overlooked right that it is a, an incredibly gameable setting uh, which unsurprisingly, there's like multiple games set in Glorantha, right? So we have Rune Quest, we have Hero Quest, and we also have Thirteenth Age in Glorantha, and then all the other board games. So there's Nomad Gods, White Bear Red Moon, which was again re retitled as Dragon Pass. There's the um, the Gods War board game, uh, and th there's a bunch of others too, I'm sure. Um, or at least a number of others. Oh, there's King of Dragon Pass, which is a video game. Um, so th there's a lot of games set in um, in, in Glorantha, and uh, um, so it's it's a very gameable setting. Um, it's not. It's set in the Bronze Age, so it's much more um, uh, reflective of the ancient world. So think, um, you know, ancient Egypt. Think Sumeria. Think ancient Greece. Um, uh, think, you know, ancient Mesopotamia, think ancient India, um, think, you know, like th that sort of world. It, it inhabits a space that is this ancient world, Bronze Age, um, fantasy setting. And it is thoroughly a fantasy setting, um, because there are, you know, um, uh, so many elements of it that are, that are kind of, um, uh fascinating um 
so like just <laughs> um for example just let me just pull something out of the air this is this is a pretty pretty uh, notorious one um uh, so i already mentioned the ducks but like then we have the lunar empire right which is a vast um uh multi-ethnic empire that um is also maybe like you know is is very like got a very high standard of living and um maybe if you're going to live on glorantha maybe if you you know if you're one of the you know citizens of the lunar empire then you you know probably have a pretty high standard of living and your life is probably pretty nice right um, however, the Lunar Empire is also kind of creepy, right? Because they have incorporated chaos demons into their sort of magic. They have, um, they're, they're colonialists. Um, they have slavery, right? So there's a lot of incredibly, like, really <laughs> messy things about the Lunars, right? That, that, like, we should look at them and go, okay, right, you know, like, this is, we don't feel like, um, we, we can look at that culture and, and, and say, okay, I, I recognize elements of that culture, but I'm also deeply uncomfortable with aspects of that culture, too, right, um, and, uh, um, and emblematic of this is the fact that they have essentially a gigantic kaiju, which they use to sort of uh, bludgeon all of the um, uh, surrounding nations into allegiance to the Lunar Empire, which is this thing called the Crimson Bat. Um, so it's this gigantic Rodan-sized um, <laughs> giant flaming red bat, which comes, you know, uh, out of the underworld, right? And uh, um, And I guess they have to, like feed people to it so because it, it eats souls or something and there's a whole cult of lunar priests whose job is just to keep the bat fed <laughs> like this is insane right but this is this is this is the stuff that's in the setting so uh that's the crimson bat right there so this is the Gloranthan source book by the way which is a if you're gonna get into the setting this is a pretty good um uh primer uh and it's not super expensive it's like you know 30 bucks or something yeah like for, for 39 and 95 um uh so it's a pretty good book it's not super detailed if you want to go deep into the setting there's the guide to glorantha which is a lot more expensive which i don't own but um but i um i've been looking at this and i've also got a couple of the other game books and stuff uh, and i've been reading those uh, and also reading a lot of stuff online because there's a ton of material you can just find online about the setting as well. Um, and you also you'll find probably a lot of different opinions about the setting and people disagreeing or people giving you their version of stuff in the setting, which is cool, you know, and then you can kind of just kind of take pick kind of the stuff you like, you know. Um, but this is also super cool. So if you want to get into the setting, and this is a systemless book. There's no game mechanics in this at all. It's literally just lore. So uh, um, I I highly recommend if you just and if you just love like kind of gaming lore books, you can't go wrong with this. Right? You know this is this is a good one to have. And the art is is also really really cool. So you get like, and it, it you get a, like the art in here is actually from a lot of different eras. You see. Um, you know, let me just try and find some of this stuff here. Well, like, yeah, so here's like the dragon notes, right? That's a cool picture. Um, so you see the dragon notes, who are, who are one of the races of Glorantha. Um, all of the, ra the races are really interesting and unique so that, you know, you don't just have elves, right? Of course you do, but they're called the Aldriami, and they are plant people who are associated with trees, and their actual life force may be connected to certain trees, and they have bows and arrows, which they literally 
grow, <laughs> you know, and things. So like an elf bow is like a really cool like thing because it's like a it's like literally like grown to be a weapon, you know, which is super fascinating. The idea that you could you know grow something to do that. Um, and the other thing about the setting I think is super cool, and this is maybe one of the last things I'll just talk about here, which is uh, the game is set in the the beginning kind of of the hero wars and the hero wars is this sort of apocalyptic war that is going to happen that um is sort of going to be the reset for uh the world and this the world has gone through a series of these sort of cataclysms and uh resets and this is it seems like that now the cycle is coming around again and we are about to enter the apocalyptic age of the hero wars where all of these powerful heroes are going to come together. Um, people like, uh, Jareel the Razorist from the Lunar Empire and Herrick the Berserk, the leader of the Wolf Pirates, you know, who literally wears a, uh, a, a skin of a polar bear. And it's unclear whether the polar bear is like a god that he slew and he now wears the skin of this demigod polar bear and has now become a demigod himself or is he in fact a worshiper of the de the polar bear demigod it's not clear <laughs> and um I, that's one of the things about the setting that i love that in, you get people like herrick the berserk who are just also like he's an he's a like terrifying force of destruction but he's also like somebody who like uh is super um uh kind to people who are like uh hungry and starving and and uh um extremely generous to the downtrodden parts of of people in society and things like that so you get all kinds of cool things like that where you just like um these characters who uh have uh, interesting sort of depths to them and uh um uh and again i could just i'm I'm just kind of like like just nerding out about this i realize now but but uh, that's what i'm gonna do so a little bit here so um but i think that that's one of the aspects of the setting i also like which is that that their morality in the setting is never clear exactly in terms of like who is good and who is bad it's always muddled and you might belong to a culture that has certain kind your character might belong to a culture that has certain kinds of values and sees things in a certain way right but um then but but also what's interesting from our perspective as players we can kind of see like maybe the ways in which the culture we belong to is also kind of limited in various ways and that the other cultures also the ways in which they might have some interesting advantages but also the ways in which they're limited you know so that you 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 start to see kind of that the picture of uh the fact that there are no good guys and bad guys here there's just different people and different agendas and different ideas and certainly some of the the people in the setting are kind of terrifying right like, like the, the crimson bat and the lunar empire are kind of terrifying right um but like there are good things about the lunar empire too right you know um like they uh they, they do a lot of you know there's a lot of people living in that empire just living their lives but I think that, you know, like, that's one of the things that's interesting about the setting is that sort of the hero wars seems to be suggesting that a lot of the, the sort of forces the, the, and, and things that, that people like the Lunar Empire have been sort of, you know, think they, they are in control of, there may be less in control of them than they, than they believe. Um, and that, that this is all going to come crashing down, right? And the great thing about the hero wars is that your player characters from what again whatever game system you're playing this in get to step up and be part of that so you get to be you know like you know the jasons and the achilles and the in all of the um you know the the gilgameshes you know um you know um uh um uh you know the hiawathas the whatever right you know whatever your setting is 
um, you get to be part of that um, mythic world and be, you know, one of the heroes, right? Uh, who are going to be remembered after in the subsequent coming ages, um, which are probably going to be um, less, um, less fantastic, right? Less fantastical. And, and that, that's really great. So again, this comes back to a very gameable setting. It sets up, right, you know, a, a, an environment that is just, just sort of waiting to sort of for that stuff to kind of explode. Um, and that's that a lot of that stuff has never been fully realized in the published materials. Um, but again, Cassium in the recent edition of, of RuneQuest is starting to maybe explore that stuff a little bit. So we're going to maybe get a little bit more of the Hero Wars than we did before. The only place it's really ever been explored is in the board games. Like that very first board game that Stafford published back in the mid-70s, uh, White Bear and Red Moon, is about the conflict between the White Bear being Herrick the Berserk, right? Um, and then the Red Moon represented by Jeriel the Razorus and the conflict in Dragon Pass um, between the Lunars and the Olanthi and, you know, all of their allies, um, the Sartorites and, and whatnot. So, so you've, got, you've got this sort of conflict kind of going on there. And what's interesting is that the conflict that we see there is a conflict that is also a reflection of these conflicts from earlier ages, where we seem to see... Um, that conflict being mirrored going back into these mythological times, almost to the point where, and, and, and the, the setting never tells you any of this stuff, and Stafford never wanted to sort of give answers to a lot of these things because he wanted people to sort of think about these things. And and I think that, like, what, you know, are, are these characters, like, sort of incarnations, right, in some ways? of the, um, the the gods and then the runes and the things that are sort of informing the setting. So, because there's this whole mythical age of the god time where there's a whole series of events that happen that then echo kind of throughout the setting's history. And so exactly, like, are, are people like Herrick and Jareel, like, um, echoes of these of the mythic god time it seems like they are but like exactly what does that mean and then you know a, how does that play out and then also things don't also seem to be exactly the same each time because time is still progressing forward time is this sort of thing that came into existence after the god time the god time was a timeless age and so now that we're inside the net of history Right then, then we we start to see um, like these 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 echoes sort of reverberating. Um, and anyway, but and, and how are your characters going to play into all this? Anyway, I've just been talking about this, but hopefully, I gave you a couple of uh, interesting things about the setting that I that things that I love about the setting. Um, the uh, again, the more I explore the setting, the more. Um, interested I get and uh, and I have not run a game in Glorantha yet but I am definitely going to do that so um, and I'm not sure what system I'll use but uh, um, uh, but um, I'm definitely going to do that at some point here in the future so um, okay all right um, that's all for now and um, by the way I just want to say thank you for, to everybody who has like subscribed and who has been watching my videos and stuff because the numbers have jumped recently and so i uh, just want to thank everybody for doing that and um uh see you guys in the next one okay thanks <laughs>